morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Eurasia for this morning. I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. Eurasia is some 35% of the Earth's surface. It's 5 billion people. It's a large amount of the world's energy. It's a former Soviet sphere of influence, and now a growing China sphere of influence and engagement. And right between those two great powers sits Mongolia. And we're very lucky this morning to have to kick us off a short comment by the president of Mongolia, President Batulga, if I could invite you to make a brief comment to kick off today's panel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mongolia, uh, Mongolia actively participates in the World Economic Forum. Uh, and I'm very glad to participate in this session of Strategic Outlook of Eurasia. Uh, and as you mentioned just now, the Eurasia contains five uh, billion people. Uh, and uh, so I do think that uh, we will discuss more on uh, how to uh, bring development to the people of this continent. For Mongolia, we are located in between the Russia and China, two big neighbors and two big countries. We connect the Eurasia. And uh, during the past years, we have built around 6,000 kilometers of highways and 1,000 kilometers of railways which connect to the Eurasia and it constitutes to the connectivity of to Eurasia. And, and I would like to propose here that we would cooperate further on connecting the Central Asian plateau and the Mongolia uh, further in the future and I'm very uh, happy to participate in this session, and I would like to uh, wish you a success to the discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's <coughs> jump straight in. I have on my left, and I'll introduce each panelist as I ask them an opening question. President Ilham Aliyev, the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Um, as we said, Eurasia is now, now has these great powers, Russia and China on each side. As president of Azerbaijan, who do you call first, Moscow or Beijing? <laughs> Baku. <laughs> Baku. <laughs> yeah, our policy is friendly towards our neighbors, but at the same time, our national interests first. Therefore, all the achievements which uh, we enjoy during the years of independence we achieved uh, due to the commitment of our people to our independence and to the fact that we've managed to implement very serious reforms in political and economic area. And our achievements are also reflected in Davos uh, World Economic Forum's annual assessment. Mm -hmm. We have a very high level of uh, development in infrastructure. And as far as roads construction and quality of roads is concerned, we are number 27 in the world. Fantastic. I was interested to see that you've refreshed your government. You've yes. brought in young technocrats. Yes, exactly. The government uh, was changed. Uh, new people were invited to the government, uh, well educated, with modern vision. Because as I said publicly many times, in 21st century, we cannot achieve success with the vision of 20th century. And uh, therefore, the new people were brought not only to the government, but also to the presidential administration, <coughs> which also was changed largely. And next month, we will have early parliamentary elections. The aim of that was also uh, to uh, give opportunity to people to select those people whom they trust. And the parliament, I'm sure, after election, 
will be an important part of the continuation of the reforms. And for Azerbaijanis who want their lives to get better, what do you hope this new government will deliver to them? What will they see over the next year or two that, that's different? I think that uh, in the previous times we largely invested into infrastructure projects. Therefore, today, with respect to access to electricity, according again to Davos Forum, Azerbaijan is number two. Uh, gasification level in Azerbaijan is 96%. Uh, we've built 16,000 kilometers of roads and more than 3,000 uh, schools and 700 hospitals. But that was part of the state investment. What we need now, we need a new approach in the governance, good governance, transparency, accountability, uh, bringing the criteria of our life and living standards closer to the standards of uh, European Union. And I think this is possible, this is achievable, because we have a strong uh, political support. Again, I want to come uh, to the assessment of Davos Forum, which ranks Azerbaijan government's strategic vision as number 10, and uh, government's ability to provide stability number 11 in the world. Mm -hmm. So the new government will concentrate on major challenge, which is growing population. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our economic growth must be in line with growth of population. During the time of independence, uh, we came from 7 million to 10 million people. So it needs additional infrastructure, it needs additional food supply, and uh, our population grows every year more than 100,000. That means we need at least 100,000 jobs annually, and it's not easy. Therefore, the government will address that. We will try to keep poverty as low as it is today. It's below 5%. And also, we have a long strategy of reduction of the foreign direct debt, which is today very low. It's 17% of GDP. But our target is to bring it down to 10% of GDP. And of course, uh, keeping inflation low, as it was last year, 2.5%. And the income of people must always be ahead of uh, inflation, as well as job creation must be ahead of demographic growth. I, I read that a third of the population of Central Asia is now under 15. That's, That's one third of the population under 15. If we look at youth in every other continent of the world, we see them on the streets. They're demanding more voice. They're mm -hmm. used to having more voice. Um, for that, for, and you've just explained that in your country, a growing number are those young people. Yeah. Um, what will, you know, what would you say if they want to come out on the streets and, and demand more voice? We will listen to what they want, but the fact is that in Azerbaijan, youth is not in the streets. Youth is in the universities, <laughs> at school. Youth is in the startup business. Youth is actively involved in uh, governmental issues. We have launched a very huge volunteer movement mm -hmm. and tens of thousands of people have been trained mm -hmm. in the public services sector as volunteers. And then we recruit these people, those who have good uh, results, <coughs> to the governmental uh, institutions. And uh, frankly speaking, when we see in different parts of the world youth on the streets, it's because of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Dissatisfaction with their life. They lost trust, trust in their governments. Uh, the governments uh, use populistic slogans to come to power and then cannot deliver what they promised. Mm -hmm. Actually, they lie. And the main reason for that is irresponsibility of politicians. Mm. Because we see in many countries, uh, not only in uh, uh, Europe, but in other places, that one government comes, immediately uh, the head of government is under fire. Mm -hmm. People elect him or her, and then within one year, he or her loses all the credibility. That's because the promises were given which were not been, uh, possible to implement. In Azerbaijan, we always keep our word. We never say something we cannot deliver. And year after year, living standards of our people is better. Thank you, President Aliyev. What about you? Do you, do you have a question for President Aliyev? Let me take one question from the audience. Question. He's laid out a rich agenda of what he's seeking to achieve as president. No question. You weren't expecting me to ask you, but I'm going to ask you after each speaker. So I want you to think about what you'd like to ask today's speakers. Um, let's, let's move, before we come back to uh, the president, to Kairat Kelimbetov, the governor of the Astana 
International Financial Center Authority in Kazakhstan, educated as three of the four panelists were at Moscow State University, so big thumbs up for Moscow State University. But, um, Governor, you were also educated in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Do you wish you'd learnt Mandarin and also been educated in Beijing? Yeah, I think, so let, let me put the, it the other way. Uh, since we've got independence, uh, like 30 years ago, uh, the Kazakhstan uh, has a, a multivectoral uh, foreign policy. So it means that uh, we are friendly to all uh, big superpowers globally. And at the same time, we have a very close relationship with uh, our neighbors. So with uh, Russia, Armenia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Belarus, we create Eurasian Economic Union. With, uh, we are part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We are part of the Turkic Council with Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkey. So we're trying to be part of the uh, much bigger coalition just than one. And at the same time, if you ask me what is the uh, structure of the trade, global trade of Kazakhstan, is 50% is the European Union. So it's like, uh, in order to avoid any stereotypes, in ju just 20% Russia and 20% China. I think uh, now having in mind that uh, we have a kind of new structure of the global trade, and especially after the first phase of the uh, negotiation after the trade uh, disputes between the United States and China, I think we have all to understand that we now have a kind of the new reality and we have to know uh, and to know how to work with new reality. Uh, having in mind that I am a governor of Astana International Financial Center, part of our mandate is to be the regional hub for the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So it means that we have to know how to work with our Chinese colleagues very well. And where, where is it most uncomfortable being between China and Russia? Uh, I think the most uncomfortable when we have a much bigger uh, tension between U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and again, I think that uh, the recent uh, speech of President Trump and the, how do we see the, the new trade deals or the new model of the trade, global trade policy, uh, even the countries disagree on something, mm -hmm. so they figure out something they have to be agreed. And we're moving forward. We really like that we, it's starting kind of common understanding between U.S. and China, and we are strongly believe that later on uh, all of these uh, sanctions, like uh, as a rule, will, uh, time would be uh, over. And I think now we have to be much more closer, be integrated, like a market to each other. Mm -hmm. And and are you hopeful that that's or, or no? Let me let me put this differently. What impact does it have on your country when China and the United States fight? Yeah, uh, I think uh, when we have this kind of uh, changes of the structure uh, between UA, uh, trade of uh, between U.S. and China, and we see that it's, uh, it affected like a slowdown to the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. or these sanctions against, for example, countries in Eurasian uh, Economic Union, it also slowed down our economy, which mm -hmm. is not uh, really good. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we have to think more constructive way how we should build the global economy. And, but does it have political or social effects? Yeah, I think uh, Kazakhstan is lucky. Actually, last uh, uh, 20 years, I think we did a great job in terms of the social and economic reform. In terms of the GDP per capita with Russia, we are leading economies mm -hmm. in the former Soviet Union area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, because uh, we uh, actually lucky in terms of the uh, vast uh, commodities, so it was uh, tremendous economic growth in our countries. So it doesn't mean that uh, necessarily that it should be continued the same way. And now we're thinking how to really to move to more sustainable economic growth in new reality when the super cycle for the commodities is over. I've heard you speak eloquently about connectivity. Right. One of the places where a lot of the world is feeling the discomfort between the United States and China is on technology, yeah. on Huawei, on 5G, and on this, this, this sense that for all the rest of the countries in the world, we're going to have to make uncomfortable choices. Do you, do you feel that in, in Kazakhstan? Yeah, I think, first of all, uh, I would like to remind that the Central Asia is still a landlocked country, mm -hmm. and physical connectivity means uh, a lot for, uh, for the countries in the region. We now uh, are making a great job in terms of it to connect Central Asia to the, to the rest of the world in different dimensions, like uh, West and East. 
Uh, the Kazakhstan uh, recently started to build uh, a new railways, a new dry port mm -hmm. in Korgos in the border with China, mm -hmm. which means that we now connected in a three dimension through Russian Federation to Western European ports, through uh, seaport <laughs> Aktau and uh, till uh, Azerbaijan uh, and further Georgia, Turkey to West, uh, uh, Eastern European ports and through Turkmenistan and Iran to the GCC countries. So we start to be unlocked, first mm. of all. Uh, but the digital connectivity nowadays is not a everything. I think the, uh, the physical, the digital connectivity yep. or financial connectivity is also very much important. We we working on this, and I think uh, so. In these terms, uh, we don't we we want to avoid any kind of dilemmas that we mm -hmm. should we should take Amazon or or Huawei yep. or uh, or uh, someone else. I think that what the Kazakhstan is will try to also to be part of all of these uh, big. Uh, uh, alliances, technological alliances. At the same time, we have to develop our own capacity. So, but the entire idea is, uh, so let me back to the, maybe to the global agenda, is uh, the region uh, of Central Asia should be uh, connected uh, because we now see that it's a big interest between European Union and Asian countries, and especially China, to create land bridge between each other. And I think we, the countries in, the, in our part of, uh, of the world would benefit from this. Thank you. Your questions for, Pres for, for Governor Kelimbetov. Does anyone have a question for him? He's, he's laid out for you how Kazakhstan is becoming more and more linked, but also how it's affected by China-US uh, frictions. Any questions to you? Now, clearly our speakers are being comprehensive and clear. Um, <laughs> um, we'll come back to some of the issues that are being raised about um, geostrategically what's going to happen in the region. But let me move and introduce Tatiana Valovaya, who is now Director General of the United Nations, in other words, heading the United Nations office in Geneva. But before that, uh, Tatiana, you were playing a very important role in kind of Russia's vision of a Eurasian economic area. What, what was your triumph on that? What, was your, what do you feel was your biggest success on that? Well, my triumph, and here I see lots of people who participated in mm. our common triumph, mm. Mr. Kalambetov, mm. Mrs. Uh, Jana Rajanova, some other people, was establishing the Eurasian Economic Union, mm -hmm. which was established uh, on the 1st of January 2015, and we just celebrated the fifth anniversary. That was a great triumph because it was the result of practically two decades of work mm -hmm. of, on Eurasian economic integration. It was not just we've built the union overnight or over two years. It was a work of mistakes made, of different paths explored, lessons learned for 20 years. So that was the biggest tri uh, triumph. And what was the biggest lesson that you learned? The biggest lesson, I think, was that we have to learn from the experience of other regional economic mm -hmm. organizations. Of course, European Union for us was and still is the role model, and we learned lots of lessons from the uh, European uh, experience, both positive lessons but also negative lessons. But one lesson for us was that we shouldn't always uh, copy other regional structures. Mm -hmm. We can uh, and should use some innovative approaches. For example, for many, many years, practically for two decades, there was a dilemma for us. We understood that if we want to have a regional economic organization at a high level, we need to build a supranational organization like European Union. For us, that men newly independent states, we have to delegate our sovereignty. And it was a big political issue. And then one day we realized that delegating sovereignty to a supranational body is not losing your own sovereignty, but it's pulling your national sovereignties and becoming more influential. And for us, that was a very important uh, lesson. At the same time, we didn't use the European uh, uh, experience in decision making. And we decided that in our union, in spite of the different size of our economies, for example, take uh, Belarus or Armenia or Kyrgyzia, small economies or bigger economies like Kazakhstan or Russia, all are equals. And decision making is one country, one voice. And it was a very difficult decision to make, but that was exactly one which made us po uh, uh, possible to create the union and for the union to develop. 
how did you persuade countries that by pooling sovereignty they would be stronger? This is an argument that lost out in the United Kingdom where I work at Oxford. So how did you persuade countries? How did you persuade presidents like those we have here? That, that How do you persuade them that this is a good idea? You know, uh, I think uh, differently from the situation in the European Union. When we started the integration process, we had much more support from the grassroots, from the population, than from the elite. That, I think, is different from the situation in the United Kingdom. Because uh, people were still remembering the Soviet Union. They still remembered economic cooperation, regional economic cooperation, and they suffered from lots of ties which have been broken. Mm -hmm. So people wanted to live and work together. They did not want to live in one country, but they wanted to be able to travel around, to be able to work all around without uh, any problems. And we had this uh, support from the population. But from the uh, elite, we had really to sit down and discuss. And say, for example, we understand that in the international arena, very few countries are absolutely sovereign. We are all parts of the global uh, system. We are all parts of uh, global agreements. So we are delegating our um, sovereignty as it is. It's not possible to be absolutely independent in your decision making. You have to take into account the views, the situations, the economic weight of your partners. So when you are creating regional economic uh, organization, you are giving an opportunity for smaller nations for their word, uh, voice to be heard on the international arena. I'll give you a very a simple ex uh, example. I worked a lot with the United Nations before I came uh, to Geneva. And I was very proud that Eurasian Economic Union in the year 2017 was the first and I think still the only regional economic organization which is presented in New York on the political level on sustainable development, its report on achieving a sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. the first regional economic organization. And it was Kyrgyzia, a very small Central uh, Asian country, which presented this report on behalf of the Union. So I think that shows that really small countries, because they are part of regional economic organizations, have more possibilities to be heard and uh, uh, seen in the international arena. Thank you. President Aliyev, can I bring that back to you? Do young people in Azerbaijan, do you, do you think they share that vision, this aspiration to be part of a regional organization? and delegate sovereignty to that regional organization? Is there uh, grassroots support for that idea uh, in Azerbaijan? I don't think so. I think the main idea and the main ideology of Azerbaijan, including the young generation, is sovereignty, independence, and reliance on uh, our own resources. Mm -hmm. And me as a president, one of my targets was to transform Azerbaijan into a self-sufficient country, that the country does not depend on anyone. Uh, in other words, economic independence was the uh, main, pri main priority because this is a foundation for political independence. Of course, different countries have different agenda. Economies of different countries is more vulnerable than uh, others. Uh, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, once again, our geographical location is very advantageous. Plus, we invested largely into creation of modern infrastructure. Second, as you mentioned, our generation is very young mm. and we have extra labor resources and very creative. And of course, we are rich in natural resources, oil and gas, which create um, energy mm. security for us. And therefore, uh, our relations with our neighboring countries and the big number of partners are based on uh, mutual interest. Mm -hmm. And plus, in every uh, issue related to our presence in that or other international body, we look at the pragmatic side, what it will give to us. If it gives us more economic incentives, more opportunities for business, more stability, more security, of course we are considering that and we are members of a number of international institutions. One of them is non-alignment movement. We Terrific. Can I, can I take that back? Uh, excuse me, Fred, to Tatiana Volovaya. So if the union would give Azerbaijan more economic investment, more opportunity for growth, 
Could it? Would it? What's the argument that you might make to the people of Azerbaijan? You know, one of uh, very important lessons we learned from the European Union, mm -hmm. you, should know, you should never go uh, for aggressive marketing. You should, <laughs> you should never uh, go for quick enlargement. Yeah. Only those countries who really want to yeah. join the integration should join. And whenever a country raises an issue, and I was the head of delegations on two accession treaties, and we tried to be very, very pragmatic, and we even raised this, are you sure you want to join the union? Do you know the consequences mm. for your economic policies? Do you realize this and this? If you are sure, then you should proceed. So I think that uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, like all other uh, organizations, should not press anybody to join. And s second, I think, I think it's very important, as I said, to change the perception. Joining regional economic organization is not losing your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. You are delegating certain economic powers to supranational body, but this body is still under the control of the nation states. They do it voluntarily, mm -hmm. and they uh, have still the mechanism of control over these bodies. So there is a different perception. It's not about that, well, everybody is done somewhere. Thank you, C Governor. Can I also clarify yes, just please. in terms of uh, the perception of Eurasian Economic Union? But I, I like what the uh, President Aliyev just mentioned. Mm -hmm. that I think the two important uh, uh, dimensions is like, first is for each country is a national interest. Mm -hmm. So we now we see that it should be national interest of the, each country. Mm -hmm. So national interest means the econo uh, own economic policy, creating of job places, supporting the local producers. So each country has their own agenda. The second, uh, what the President Ali mentioned, is a pragmatic policy. So we have to be all pragmatic. I mean, and uh, having in mind that we have a, like a past, uh, we've been uh, in uh, previously in the different uh, historical period. Now, when we've got independence, we are very pragmatic. We're trying to focus on, on the uh, enlargement un of our markets. So we, for example, in Kazakhstan, we have a population 18 million people, one eight. Mm -hmm. And it's a very small market to develop your own economies. Mm -hmm. We should join to some bigger uh, trade platform. And Eurasian Economic Union is about delegating only trade policy, mm -hmm. not more. Mm -hmm. So it's at least, uh, if uh, in, I can say even, it's, first of all, it's Eurasian Economic Union. Mm -hmm. And economic means like custom union plus, 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 in different uh, dimension for freedom of labor, of capitals. It's easier for our business to, to think about their strategy if they see the access to the market. This is first. The second, we have a bilateral relationship, Russia and Kazakhstan. So let me talk about our countries. Uh, we, have a common, uh, we have a common border, which is more than 7,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest dry border in the world, bigger than US and Can between US and Canada, you can imagine. And this is access to us through the Russian transport system to the Western European ports, to, the, uh, to, to European markets through different, let's say, uh, pipelines, ro railways, roads. And I think it's fair when we have a, uh, let's say, uh, the relationship, uh, strategic relationship, which should be between uh, neighborhood. Mm, thank you very much. Let me um, bring in Andre Kostin, who is um, chairman of the VTB Bank and well known to all of you as a regular at Davos. In 2018, the United States announced sanctions on a number of Russians, and you were one of those. Um, what does that feel like, and how does that shape your, your, your view of the United States and its allies? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that in spite of all this, I am uh, coming to Davos for the 25th year mm. now, and it's uh, out of 50. Uh, and um, uh, of course, um, I'm not uh, now able to travel to Washington, New York, which allows me to spend more time in Baku and North Sultan. Mm -hmm. uh, but on a more serious note, I would say that, of course, no one can be pleased when the sanction imposed on him. And particularly when you feel that they're completely unjustified. I was put on the list as a senior government official responsible for Ukraine, Syria, uh, hacking and undermining American democracy. Uh, for the last 28 years, as far as I remember, I've been a banker. And I'm running uh, the uh, joint stock bank 
And I always develop an extremely good relationship with American banks. I was friendly with all the major CEOs, uh, and I was very supportive, and we had a lot of transactions together in Russia. And, um, you know, we still enjoy a very good relationship between our organizations, but unfortunately, I have to cut off my uh, direct contact with, uh, with American CEOs. And, um, you know, in spite of this fact, I would say that uh, I have no hard feelings towards uh, America or even the American administration. And I wish uh, Mr. Trump every success uh, in, um, in, in his impeachment saga because I also feel that, that it is unjustified. I very much remember the meeting in Davos in August 2017. That's um, a business advisory council in August when Mr. Al Gore, uh, made a speech only seven months after the inauguration of Mr. Trump. And he said, we would impeach Mr. Trump either for Russia or for money laundering or for insanity. I asked the question, why not to start vice versa? Why you start with Russia? Start with insanity. It would be much, much probably easy. But the smile of the history that's starting with Russia, they're finishing with Ukraine now. And so I think it is just, pro my opinion, just as groundless as any accusation of Mr. Trump having any special relationship with Russia, which is the investigation completely failed. Nobody is now trying to remember about this in America. So no hard feelings, very friendly approach to America. I like America, it's a great country, but they've got their, I think, domestic, uh, mainly political problems. And uh, we don't expect any change of heart unless, unless those those issues are sorted out inside the um, United States, then we very much hope that they will be in a position to build a, a more practical line towards Russia and will have better relationship because nowadays politicians prefer not to say that, but we are at the state of the Cold War. That's, that's, that's the fact of life. So, so pick, picking up that, um, you've been coming to Davos for 25 years. 25 years ago, did you imagine that there would be a Sino-Russian rapprochement of the kind that we're now seeing? No, of course. So all th through all these 25 years, we had a different uh, kind of uh, uh, interest uh, to Russia. In, in, uh, the first time I came in 1996, when uh, in Russia it is said that the fate of Russia was decided in Davos, because all the major, all the largest businessmen met in Davos and decided to support Mr. Yeltsin. At the same time, it was a great fun to see the leader of the Russian Communist Party, Mr. Zuganov, walking here along the, uh, you know, um, promenade uh, and showing, uh, you know, that he was the real candidate. Uh, and he, at that time, everybody thought that he would become a new president of Russia. But uh, then, of course, we saw um, uh, Mr. Putin coming to Davos, Mr. Medvedev twice. Unfortunately, nowadays, I, I, I think uh, we, Russia should be better represented in Davos and speak more to the international community. Uh, but of course, uh, at, the, at the time of, uh, at the beginning of this year, of, of this century, and um, we couldn't imagine that uh, uh, in 2020 we will be at, at such state of uh, poor relationship between Russia and the United States, particularly in Russia and Europe as well. But tell me about the relationship with China. You've said, you know, you've had to put on hold some of your relationships with American banks. What about Chinese banks? Are you, are you well, we working didn't. with them more? I'm not saying that we, we put on hold relationship with American banks. Uh, it's a normal business as usual within the uh, scope of uh, um, regulatory sanctions imposed by Europe and, and America. But, but they are, they are uh, not preventive from working together. Uh, they concern only some limited areas of cooperation. Well, you know, Chinese, you know, the thing is that sanctions are mainly effective in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, the threat of the so-called secondary uh, sanctions, uh, they, they, that's a fear for, for all the banks. Uh, and for the Chinese, by the way, uh, for Europeans, much more than for Americans. Mm -hmm. Americans, banks, they, they, they've got a direct line to OFAC, and it's much easier for them to, to clear the, the problem. So we feel that uh, sometimes the job is easily done with American banks rather than with Chinese, for example, or, or Europeans. That's the fact of life. So the American sanctions actually make it harder for you to work with Chinese banks? It is, it is. But as I said, the sanctions, uh, maybe not everybody knows, the so-called sectoral sanctions imposed on Russian leading banks, they uh, relate only to two areas specific. We cannot borrow money from the Western, from American investors for more than two weeks, and we can't sell them new shares. That's it. All other operations are allowed. They are not restricted. 
So it, it doesn't, of course, it does create, of course, the not a very favorable atmosphere to investment in Russia. And the, but on the other hand, it doesn't prevent us from working uh, with, uh, with uh, including American banks or, on, on different, uh, on different, uh, in different areas, including selling bonds uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, working on the Russian stock market and this kind of thing. We've heard from the other four speakers this morning about Eurasia. Is Russia part of Eurasia? Do you, do you describe yourself as Eurasian? Yes, very much so. And uh, of course, we, uh, 30 years ago, we, we, we were one country. And we were a country, one country for, for more than a century. And there's a lot of common uh, between us. Um, and um, uh, and uh, we would definitely feel, uh, I don't know, personally, I, I think we are Eurasians. Uh, but Russia always was between Europe and, 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 and Asia. You know, 100 years ago, uh, Russian elite was speaking only French uh, and couldn't even speak some, uh, some um, uh, uh, Russian sometimes. But nowadays, you know, you looked five years ago, you looked at, for example, um, uh, maybe not a different area, Ukraine, but it was funny to see how Ukrainian cabinet was speaking Russian because it was the only language which could, which could, we could keep them together. So we, we are, of course, we don't feel very much difference when, when I talk to my, to my friend Mr. Kalembetov and other you know, people in other countries. Mm -hmm. we, we are uh, to a very big extent of the same origin. And don't forget that five million Russians living in, uh, in Southern Caucasus and Central Asia and more than three million uh, people from Central Asia and uh, South and Caucasus work inside Russia mm -hmm. and actually transferring uh, about $10 billion a year uh, to their native country. So we still have very close, Russia is still number one, number two trading partner for, for most of these uh, eight, eight, eight countries, maybe with exception of Azerbaijan, but we agreed with, with Mr. President to improve this mm -hmm. and to increase mm -hmm. Russian bilateral mm -hmm. economic cooperation. Mm -hmm. So yes, but in, and, in those, and in those countries, um, you know, the, the, the President was talking about the fierce sense of independence in his country, hard fought. So it is true that, that Russia controlled a lot of these countries previously, but it no longer does. No. How does Russia step carefully on that? And, and how does it avoid feeling like the colonial overlord? Yeah. Well, uh, I think there's a lot of discussions and, and comments here that Russia or Putin wants to reestablish the Soviet Union. It is just impossible, no matter who wants what it's impossible to restore the Soviet Union. We, for 30 years, uh, there is a eight or nine together with Russia, independent countries uh, with their own, uh, uh, you know, elites, with own presidents. And we just, what we want is actually two things, develop uh, maybe to restore to a certain extent cooperation and integration uh, with these countries. And secondly, uh, we don't want this to be a territory for particularly military competition between the United States, China and Russia. And of course, we don't want to see uh, those countries to be involved in any, you know, military uh, military operations or even military stance against Russia, like like uh, having the uh, American military bases uh, or, or this kind of thing, or joining the NATO and uh, and inviting NATO troops, like you know, Georgia, for example, is is planning to do. So that that's our vested interest in providing security in the region, uh, because we want to feel secure ourselves. Mm -hmm. Before we close, I'm now going to come to you for questions from the audience and then to come back to the panellists and ask each of you for one bright hope for the next year in your country and in, or, or in your region. Or if not a bright hope, your worst nightmare that might occur this coming year. Questions from you. Are there any questions for today's panellists? No? You've all, you're all in agreement? Any, any suggestions, comments? Then let's come back to the panel and ask, what is your bright hope and or your worst nightmare for the region? President Aliyev. I think the most important now, especially taking into account the regional situation and uh, new emerging uh, conflict zones is uh, regional stability. We don't have internal uh, risks in the country, whether it's political risks or economic risks. Country is stable, development is sustainable, we have a very broad agenda of reforms which are in the phase of implementation which will create better opportunities for our people. The main concern and uh, the main potential nightmare mm -hmm. would be aggravation of tension beyond our borders. Mm -hmm. And for that, unfortunately, we are not responsible and we mm, cannot to full degree influence that process. The responsibility lies on the superpowers on the big powers which must agree 
on uh, certain issues between themselves so that uh, this fragile stability is not uh, shaken more. And for those in the room who don't know the region well, what are the tensions that you're most worried could flare up? You know, we see those tensions uh, close to our borders. We see tensions in Afghanistan. We see unresolved, uh, you know, situations there. We are ourselves uh, subject of occupation by Armenia, and this is a permanent source of threat. Our 20% almost of our territories are under Armenian occupation in violation of international norms and United Nations Security Council resolutions. We see aggravation of tension with respect to U.S.-Iranian relationship. And the many other hotspots in the region which are already are flaring our potential. Therefore, uh, we are very interested in safety, security, and predictability beyond our borders. Because even uh, economic difficulties outside of Azerbaijan can, be, uh, influ can influence our economic and social situation. Therefore, uh, I think stability in the region is the main concern which we have. Mm -hmm. And instability in the region is a main mm -hmm. nightmare, if I may put it so. Thank you, uh, President. Governor? Yeah, I think uh, I agree that uh, the geopolitical tension is quite, uh, uh, which we, we, uh, we cannot influence, but uh, it's better to avoid to the global superpowers uh, the further dimensions. So I think even the recent examples, what happened at the beginning of this year in Iran, is, is not, uh, let's say, good news for the region. So mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, indirectly will affect uh, not only for Middle East, but also mm -hmm. for, for the, the rest of the world. I think uh, this is what we, 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 we want to avoid uh, as much as possible. Kazakhstan always plays a significant role in all these peaceful negotiation, including this, uh, the first uh, uh, agreement about nuclear deals, uh, which were the first negotiation between uh, the uh, countries uh, happened in Kazakhstan. I think we will continue to play the role like a peaceful country, which is try to bring countries together to the same table. Next year, uh, this year actually, June, the WTO ministerial meetings will happen in the city of Nur Sultan, which is again our kind of commitment to the multilateralism, which is I think the, the key platform. So back to the more optimistic uh, mm -hmm. issues is I think uh, uh, we also would like to announce that uh, so uh, actually after this uh, uh, session, we have a signing ceremony with World Economic Forum in terms of the uh, opening the affiliated center of the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. centers of, uh, uh, of the World Economic Forum. Why is it important for us? Because I think is now the key challenge is uh, we should uh, not, uh, we should uh, having these opportunities uh, to leapfrog to the, uh, with the new technologies. Uh, we should not avoid this kind of pessimistic uh, uh, paradigm to be uh, left behind. And I think that the new technologies uh, give uh, for the new emerging markets opportunities actually to implement the new technologies uh, even faster than developed countries. And back to the regional agenda, I think again important that uh, we are restoring the Central Asia, we are trying to connect Central Asia and kind of having the modern uh, political slogan. So let's make Silk Road great again. <laughs> great. Um, Tatiana Velovaya. Velovaya. Well, you know, uh, my greatest hope is, well, and I start with that, I see at least three ladies in the room in red, and I think we unconsciously are celebrating the coming Chinese New Year. And this Chinese New Year, it starts a new 12-year cycle. And my greatest hope is that this is, will be a different new cycle because the previous uh, 12 years we permanently went from bad to worse. And I hope that this is the new cycle when we will go from bad to better and better and better. So I'm really hoping that we will be able to ease the geopolitical tensions, that we will be able to go back on track of closer international cooperation on building peace, prosperity for everybody. And my uh, biggest fear, I'm afraid that uh, we are losing the trust and the confidence in multilateral system. Because I think that's a crucial risk because not only on the level of national political elites, but also on the level of population, we are afraid of losing this support and we need multilateralism these days 
much better than we needed before. That's why, for example, this year when we are celebrating 75th anniversary of the United Nations, we started a global conversation with everybody all around the world what we want, like the future for us, and what kind of the United Nations we need for this future. So I think that's a very important year for us really to realize how we can fine tune in a multilateral system, but really what we have to do to preserve it. Thank you. Mr. Andrei Kostin. I think the nightmare is the terrorism uh, and radical Islamic movements, because according, uh, according information, uh, um, majority of those people or terrorists fighting in Syria came from this region, including the Russian caucus. So, of course, these people do come back sometime, and of course, it just shows that there is a lot of ground for, for, for the terrorism and radical Islamic movements in this region. And secondly, don't forget about the neighboring countries like Afghanistan and Iran. All these can substantially undermine uh, the political stability in the region, which would be really a nightmare. Uh, on the positive side, I very much hope that uh, the region, all the countries will be as prosperous uh, and democratic as Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. Uh, and they will be neither, um, uh, um, that will be not a Russian empire, but with friendly countries, uh, with developing good relationship with Russia, uh, as well as uh, with the rest of the world, China, America, and other countries. Thank you very much. So pulling it all together, there's some, the, the, the gloomy outlook for the, for the next year is, would stem from predominantly geopolitical tensions. Obviously the US-China reverberating in the region, the, the, and its reverberations in Afghanistan, in Iran, as you've said, um, in terrorist movements. In other words, the need for really careful, multilateral global management of some of those tensions. And as Tatiana reminds us, that multilateral system's looking very fragile. So that's the, that's the gloomy part of our panel's outlook for the next year. The positive part of the outlook to, for, for the governor is let's make the Silk Road great again. It says even though the multilateral system might be crumbling, within the Eurasian area there are other institutions emerging. The Eurasian um, Economic Union, China's initiatives in the region, um, including the BRI and the Silk Road initiatives. And there's also a sense from this panel of renewal. Um, the president talked about giving young technocrats much more voice in the government, um, giving young people across your countries a greater role in, in shaping the future. And I think the biggest takeaway of all is the extraordinary leap in connectivity across the region. You know, that's the, that's the silk route in practice. I think every one of you have talked about the thousands of miles of both road and rail connectivity that is starting to make this region really a, a huge global hub. So thank you for coming, but thanks especially to the President of Mongolia who kicked us off and to each of our panelists here today. Can you join me in thanking them? Mm -hmm.